Well, good afternoon, everyone. Fantastic to see quite a few people coming in to this afternoon's webinar. My name is Dr. Melissa Lovell. I'm the convener and research fellow of the Freilich Project for the Study of Bigotry at the Australian National University. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we're standing here in Canberra. It's the uh, Ngunnawal people. Um, obviously, other um, other peoples and other parts of this beautiful country of ours. Today, we will be welcoming uh, Dr. Michael Tai. Oh, we've got another Michael Tai. <laughs> Hello. Um, we'll be welcoming Dr. Michael Tai, uh, University of Queensland. He's a lecturer in developmental psychology there, and also a 2021 recipient of Pilot Project's ECR Small Research Grant Project. Um, so that's some seed funding, um, a grant project that will be opening up for new applicants for next year in the next week or so. So you might be interested to have a look at that. Um, he'll be giving um, a seminar on his research, research motivated prejudice behind the perpetual foreigner syndrome. I might let him uh, introduce himself more fully and um, let us know all about his research. I'm really looking forward to, to learning more. Michael will be talking for about um, 35 minutes or so, and there'll be some time for some questions at the end. Michael. Thank you so much, Melissa. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for um, attending today. Uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity to present uh, a bit of my work. Uh, before we get started, um, I just wanted to check whether everyone can see my slides. Yeah, sweet. Awesome. So I just wanted to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which uh, we are all zooming in uh, today. And uh, I pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. Uh, I recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So today I'm going to be talking about some of the research that I've been conducting over the past few years looking at uh, this idea of the uh, perpetual foreigner syndrome. And so uh, it's a line of work looking at this concept called identity denial uh, and how it affects perceptions of Asian people uh, living in Australia. Uh, now, I think I'll just get right into it because it's a, it's a it's a long talk, but uh, uh, first of all, let's take a step back and talk about the concept of uh, national identity. Uh, the social identity literature proposes that the groups that we belong to form an important part of our self-concepts, and this is no different when it comes to uh, our national group. And so uh, irrespective of race or ethnicity, we find that uh, majorities and ethnic minorities alike do identify strongly as part of the nations uh, in which they were born and raised. Uh, but the problem here is that national identity isn't equally ascribed to people of all races and ethnicities. And in fact, uh, due to... Uh, histories of uh, institutionalized exclusion and uh, conceptualizations of uh, national identity according to you know ethnic boundaries in many western nations white is considered the prototype when people think of who an australian is when people think of who an american is they typically think first and foremost of someone who is white and uh, I ran some research into this in the Australian context, presenting people with uh, a range of averaged faces of white, black, uh, East Asian and West Asian faces. And for these faces, I asked people to rate the extent to which uh, they felt the faces were, um, you know, intelligent, friendly, Australian, hardworking. And, uh, of course, the variable of interest here was how Australian the faces were rated to be. And the research showed a striking difference in uh, the perceived Australian identity of faces as a function of uh, the race of the face. You can see here that uh, white was uh, considered to be significantly more Australian than black, East Asian and West Asian faces. And East Asian and West Asian faces were considered to be uh, less Australian or the least Australian. Uh, 
And so we're, what does this sort of manifest in, right? So it's not something that uh, stays in the minds of perceivers. It actually has implications and consequences for how Asian Australians are treated. And one of those is national identity denial. It's this phenomenon whereby uh, Asian Australians and other ethnic minorities because they are not considered true and authentic Australians, they are consistently treated as though they do not belong. They're uh, treated as though they are foreigners in their own land. And this results in awkward conversations, uh, you know, receiving questions such as, you know, where are you from? Uh, followed up by where are you really from when they say that, uh, you know, actually Australia is uh, where I'm from and Australia is how I identify. And, and we see this everywhere we look, all right? So this is a campaign on the uh, Qantas social media. And you can see in the comments here that uh, it, this is uh, depicting, you know, Asian Australian families. And we're getting uh, some comments just asking about where the Aussies are in this photo. All right. So uh, really, it's not implicit. It's this uh, explicit denial of national identity for those who belong to ethnic minority groups. And there is emerging literature over the past decade, uh, which shows that national identity denial and this sense of being treated as though you were foreign has really huge implications uh, for uh, ethnic minorities and particularly people of Asian descent living in Australia, living in uh, the US. So it's associated with all these psychological well-being outcomes, including uh, a lowered sense of belonging, increased depressive symptoms, lower life satisfaction, lower hope. And that's just some of uh, the findings in the literature, and there is uh, more coming out uh, every year, uh, elucidating the potential negative and damaging implications of being denied one's national identity. And it also has social and political implications. Uh, and so some recent research we've conducted in the Australian context uh, found that Asian candidates, uh, political candidates, were perceived as less Australian than white political candidates. And this had indirect effects on uh, trust and uh, support in the political candidate, uh, which could be explained by how loyal they were perceived to be to the country, such that uh, we show this indirect effect whereby Asian Australians, uh, Asian Australian candidates, because they were perceived as uh, having lower national identity, uh, they were in turn perceived as being less loyal to the country, and this in turn reduced trust in them and support for them uh, in terms of uh, voting intentions. And so it does represent a problem. What we want to address is how Asian people respond to this identity denial. And so the research shows that uh, Asian Australians and Asian Americans respond in a way to try and assert their identity once it has been denied to them. And we call this national identity assertion. So the earliest demonstrations of this uh, came uh, from the uh, US American context. And they found that uh, Asian Americans who were denied their American identity, uh, in response to that, they reported greater engagement in American culture. Uh, they recalled more American TV shows, and they were more likely to report a prototypical American food as their favorite food, and also order uh, fattier foods, presumably conforming to American norms. And in my PhD, uh, I also found that Australians uh, did the same thing, right? So Asian Australians who were denied their national identities, uh, not only did they report feeling a uh, greater sense of Australian identification, uh, they also felt that they were white on the inside. They reported feeling white on the inside because they recognized that what was holding them back from this national identity was the fact that they were not white and uh, uh, externally they were Asian. I published a study uh, about a decade ago now uh, showing that this didn't 
only apply to the self, but it also applied to other people. Uh, so when Asian Australians rated other Asian targets, if they perceived high permeability, sorry, uh, they preferred other Asian targets who acted in a white way and other white targets who acted in an Asian way. Uh, and we conceptualize this as their preference for boundary blurrers, people who see the boundaries between Asian and white Australian society as being permeable, uh, permeable as being crossable. They prefer people who blur these boundaries even further. All right. And we didn't really see these effects when they perceived low permeability across these boundaries. So all in all, this shows that Asian people who are denied their national identity and who seek acceptance into white Australian society, uh, they assert their identities through cultural immersion. All right. So they claim immersion in the national culture. And if they perceive high permeability between whites and Asians, they also prefer other Asians who are culturally immersed. And uh, I was really interested in uh, this question of do these signals of cultural immersion actually bolster perceptions of national identity? So if an Asian Australian can demonstrate just how immersed they are in the national culture, does this effectively signal to others that they are truly Australian. And so uh, the question in this next line of studies I was uh, I'm going to talking uh, talk about uh, focuses on this uh, this question. So in the US context they have shown that uh, Asian Americans who are larger are considered more American than Asian Americans who are smaller uh, in body size and they've also found that Asian Americans who are gay are considered more American than Asian Americans presumed straight and now the author's uh, conclusions regarding this were that these factors were indirect signals of cultural immersion, all right? So being larger conforms to body size norms in the US and uh, being gay uh, was considered more acceptable within the context of the US. And because of these cultural factors, people were likely to perceive an Asian American as more American if they were larger in body size and if they were gay rather than presumed straight. But in all of these situations, the authors found that this didn't really close the gap between the national identity perceptions of white uh, versus Asian people. That is, an Asian American portrayed as larger or as gay was never considered equally Australian, uh, sorry, American as uh, a white American. And so we wanted to assess, you know, what actually can close the gap, if anything, uh, between uh, the national identity perceptions of white versus Asian people. And one of the factors we've looked at is accent, right, to see whether accent can close the gap, because the research shows uh, that People rely on accent more than race when judging nationality. Uh, and so uh, researchers have suggested that participants actually become blind to visual category information uh, regarding race and ethnicity in the presence of more meaningful auditory category information. Right, so we wanted to see whether accent can actually override the effect of race in perceptions of the national identity of Asian Australians or whether race still exerts some influence in national identity perceptions. So we randomly uh, assigned a sample of Asian, uh, uh, sorry, of just Australian participants to one of three conditions. So uh, we had the audio only condition, the uh, video only condition, and the audio plus video condition. So I'll, I'll let you uh, see what... Uh, these uh, looked and sounded like. So in the audio condition, they could only hear the person's voice. In the video only condition, they could only see the person, but couldn't hear their accent. And then in the audio and video condition, uh, they could both hear and see the person.
And the key dependent variable was how Australian they perceived the person to be, right? The person uh, whose video they watched. And you can see the results here. So as expected, we found that if you could only see the person and you saw that they were Asian, they were rated as significantly less Australian than when you could hear their Australian accent, right? And they were also rated as significantly uh, less Australian when you could uh, hear them and see them, all right? But although we expected to find an equalization of Australian identity uh, across the audio only and the audio video conditions uh, based on what the previous research would suggest, we actually found a significant difference here such that if they only heard a voice, they presumed the voice to be white and they considered them more Australian than if they saw an Asian face paired with that voice. So an, Asia, uh, so an Australian accent, we found, does bolster the perceived national identity of a target speaker, but being aware of the racial identity of the speaker still undermines the effect of accent. And so the question then is, does explicit cultural immersion better signal national identity? Right, so we know from uh, the previous literature that when denied their national identity, uh, Asian people will indicate just how immersed they are in the national culture in terms of preferring the national foods, preferring uh, arts, uh, sports and such that are associated with uh, the dominant culture. And we wanted to ask the question of whether depicting yourself in a way that is immersed within the culture bolsters your Australian identity to the extent that you would be considered uh, comparatively Australian to the dominant group, that is white Australian. So we recruited uh, Australian participants and we randomly assigned them to see either an Asian or a white target who is depicted uh, in a really culturally immersed way, what we called hyper-Australian, or who wasn't depicted with any of these Australian cues. And so you can see in the control condition, you could just see the person, right, Asian or white. And in the immersed condition, you could see, you know, they liked Vegemite, they loved the movie The Castle, they loved their lamingtons, you know, Sir Donald Bradman is a, a fave of theirs. And again, we asked the question, you know, how Australian uh, is this person, right? You can see here that uh, an Asian target depicted as being hyper-Australian was indeed uh, considered more Australian than an Asian target depicted without these cues. However, in the control condition, we found the expected effect where uh, the white control target, where a generic white target was perceived as being more Australian than a, a generic Asian target. We also found, however, that even if an Asian target was depicted as hyper-Australian, this didn't actually close the gap. Uh, in fact, in this study, we found that an Asian target depicted as hyper-Australian was perceived as no more Australian than a white target depicted without any cues to their Australianness whatsoever. And so we thought about this, and uh, this study showed that Asian people depicted as culturally immersed are considered more Australian than Asian people who are not, and Asian people depicted as culturally immersed were still considered less Australian than white people depicted in the same way. We thought perhaps this could be explained by the fact that people automatically assume Asians are more likely to have immigrated from overseas. And when you look at the statistics, uh, this is uh, the case, all right? So people may be making sensible judgments about these faces. And so in the next study, we actually manipulated the birthplace of the target, all right? So not only did we manipulate their cultural immersion, we also uh, either specified that they were born in Australia or we didn't specify this information. So this next study had eight conditions. And I'll just briefly go through this. Uh, so in the first condition, no cues to Australian identity. In the second, we had the fact that they were born in Australia only. In the third, we had uh, no birthplace information, but we had uh, culturally immersed cues. And in the final condition, this was the ultimate Australianist condition. We had both the cultural immersion cues as well as the birthplace cues. 
And the DV here was, again, perceived Australian identity. Now, you can see here that uh, the Asian target depicted as hyper-Australian, as we found in the first study, was considered more uh, uh, Australian than those who were depicted without any cues. The Asian target depicted as Australian-born only was seen as more Australian than uh, the Asian target depicted without any uh, cues to their Australian identity. And the Asian target depicted as both Australian-born and culturally immersed were uh, was considered as more Australian than the Asian target in the control condition without any of these cues. However, in each of these conditions, you can see that they were consistently evaluated as less Australian than a white target depicted in the same way. So we found in this study that cultural immersion and being born in a country uh, does boost perceptions of uh, Asian people's national identity, but there is still a discrepancy, all right? Uh, and uh, we wanted to then determine whether this racial discrepancy is a result of automatic processing or more motivated bias. And so uh, we thought there were, might have been two potential underlying bases for this discrepancy in national identity. The first is this idea of this being just an automatic judgment, all right? They're, people are using heuristics, they're using stereotypes, and there is evidence to show that uh, people do rely on stereotypes, even when they are presented with stereotype disconfirming and individuating information. And we know that there is a really strong implicit association uh, such that the Australian identity is very strongly tied to whiteness. And so national identity may just simply be more readily associated with whiteness in the mind. It may have nothing to do with prejudice uh, at all. However, the alternative explanation, of course, is that it has something to do with this underlying motivated reasoning, right? People may be motivated to uh, actually evaluate Asian Australians as less Australian. And there is research out there showing that, you know, white Australians who wish to preserve the dominant status do exhibit uh, prejudice towards Asian Australians when this is threatened. Uh, white people can react negatively to multiculturalism. And it uh, is possible then that broadening conceptions of national identity to be inclusive can be threatening. So you there can be this sense of motivated exclusion where uh, white people may be motivated to deny uh, national identity for ethnic minorities and uh, uh, Asian Australians. And so we surmise that if uh, the discrepancy is completely driven by heuristics, it shouldn't be qualified uh, by racially inclusive ideology. Uh, however, if there is some motivated reasoning underlying this discrepancy or contributing to this discrepancy, then uh, this discrepancy should be qualified by racially inclusive ideology. So in the next study, we actually measured attitudes towards multiculturalism to see how it affected this racial discrepancy. We randomly assigned Australian participants to view either the culturally immersed Asian target or the culturally immersed white target from the previous study. And in this study, we only took the uh, strongest cues of immersion, so both the birthplace and the uh, likes and interests, all right? So we compared participants' evaluations of an Asian person depicted with all this information to a white person depicted with all this information. And we also measured their attitude towards multiculturalism. Uh, and the key DV here was their perceived Australian identity. And so we found what we expected to find, replicating past work, the white target was considered more Australian than the Asian target, uh, even though both were depicted with all these cues to Australian identity. And uh, when we uh, tested for moderation by um, attitudes towards multiculturalism, we actually found a significant interaction. And so this showed us that 
the less participants endorsed multiculturalism, the more pronounced the discrepancy was, right? And so the more they endorsed multiculturalism, uh, the less pronounced the discrepancy was. And actually, at uh, really high levels of endorsement of multiculturalism, uh, this discrepancy was no longer significant. Right. So this suggests to us that, you know, people with positive attitudes towards multiculturalism do not evaluate culturally immersed Asian and white Australians differently, and that there may be some sort of motivated reasoning uh, underlying this racial discrepancy. And for interest's sake, we wanted to replicate this effect to see if it was replicable and also test what would happen for Asian and white targets depicted without any cues to their national identity. So we randomly allocated uh, Australian participants to view an Asian target or a white target who was uh, depicted as culturally immersed, as in the last study, or depicted without any uh, cues to their Australian identity. And so these were uh, the conditions. So you have uh, white and Asian targets depicted without any cues to Australian identity, as well as uh, white and Asian targets depicted uh, with many cues to their Australian identity. Again, we measured attitudes towards multiculturalism and also perceived Australian identity. And we found a main effect again, of perceived Australian identity, uh, uh, of, sorry, of uh, target race on perceived Australian identity. White targets overall were perceived as more Australian than Asian targets. We also found uh, uh, I sh a main effect of uh, the immersion condition on perceived Australian identity. So targets depicted with uh, a bunch of cues to their Australian identity were considered more Australian than um, people depicted without any cues to their Australian identity. And we found the same interaction we found in the previous study. We didn't find a three-way interaction. Uh, in other words, it didn't matter whether or not the target was depicted with cues to their Australian identity. We got a consistent interaction uh, irrespective of the cultural immersion condition, right? So it was almost exactly the same as in the first study. However, in this case, we still had a discrepancy uh, in those who highly endorsed attitudes towards multiculturalism. So the discrepancy decreased and the discrepancy uh, in those with high endorsement of multiculturalism was significantly smaller than the discrepancy in the uh, for the other participants. However, it was still significant. So this suggests that uh, national identity denial is at least in part motivated. All right, so we found that attitudes towards multiculturalism qualified the Asian white discrepancy in national identity fully in study one and partially in study two. Uh, but in all situations, we found that the discrepancy was diminished to some extent uh, in those who hold more racially inclusive ideology. And so uh, where to next? Well, we want to continue examining the factors that uh, can reduce the discrepancy that we see between minorities and the dominant majority in national identity perceptions. And past work of ours has really looked into the sort of behaviours that uh, ethnic minorities can engage in themselves in order to assert their identity and in order to reinstate their national identity. And the problematic nature of that is that it does put the onus on minorities to assimilate almost, to try to have their national identity recognised. So moving forward, it's going to be less about uh, looking at the factors or looking at the ways in which minorities can assert their identity, but more looking at how we can uh, 
increase perceptions of uh, Asian Australians and other ethnic minorities' national identity uh, in the dominant Australian community in a way that doesn't require minorities to really have to lift a finger. And uh, one approach would be to just remind people of uh, the history of Asian Australians and other ethnic minority groups uh, in Australian culture. The fact that these ethnic minority groups have been a part of Australian society for, uh, for decades, centuries even, and have been contributing to society in this time, right? There is some evidence to show that uh, people, one of the factors that is driving lowered perceptions of national identity of ethnic minorities is this belief that uh, immigration, right, is a relatively recent phenomenon. And to the extent that we can show that it is actually historical and we have had ethnic minority Australians uh, in Australian culture and as part of Australian history for years, uh, reminding people of this fact may work to reduce perceptions of foreignness and increase uh, and bolster their national Australian identity. I'd like to finish off by thanking uh, uh, the audience here today for listening and also all my collaborators and the students I've worked with uh, to produce this research. Uh, a thank you also to ANU and the uh, Freilich Project uh, in particular for funding uh, a lot of this research that I've presented today. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Fantastic, Michael. Thanks for that presentation. I think I learned a lot from that. We actually have quite a bit of time now for questions, which is fantastic. I thought I might try something. <laughs> You're worried about going over. So I, will, I, I did rush. I'm sorry if I <laughs> rushed. If, if anyone has any questions, uh, wanting me to explain anything in my talk a little bit more, uh, yeah, um, I, I can do that. I thought we might try things a little bit differently today. Yep. Um, we are recording this session, but if anyone wants to participate in conversation, ask any questions to Michael, what I suggest you do is you pop your hand up and I'll add you in as a panellist. Uh, obviously, if you don't want to be on the video, that's fine too. Um, feel free to either uh, keep your video off or to send me a question in the q and I'm happy to, um, to read it out for Michael to answer. We have a question here from Malcolm. Hi, Malcolm. Hi, Michael. I really enjoyed the talk um, and got a couple of different questions. But yeah. I'll, I'll start with one. So I, I, I take it that what you're really saying is that what's occurring is both automatic processing and racial bias, mm. but that both are in operation and it's the automatic processing that uh, change that, that um, remains maybe consistent but that yeah. the racial bias is the factor that changes over time or changes depending upon people's particular outlook towards. Um... That's right, yes. Oh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think you're, uh, you're muted, Malcolm. So I am. Um, did you get any of that question? Uh, the, the 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 start of it yeah so yeah so sure. it changes as a function of uh, yeah people's uh, ideologies yes yeah so both both are operative and it's really the question of the extent to which racial bias changes depending upon people's um particular outlook or sympathy towards multiculturalism seem to be the direction that you're taking in terms of an analysis that's right yes yeah that's really great can I ask another question too oh sorry yes. there's someone else and I'll come come back all right. <laughs> We've got Kate here as well, I think. Hi, Kate. Yeah, hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Good to hear the work and um, see how it's all uh, developing. Uh, I did. I wanted to talk a little bit about what you thought 
the next steps would be to test that theory, right? So what you're sort of saying is that um, a diverse Australia is not front of mind for people when they're thinking about who's an Australian, uh, who we are um, and sort of what we're proud of. Do you think there's an experimental way that you could test that idea that if if people did have a more diverse understanding of the history uh that that would change the representation they have of of being Australian or is there other kind of work that you think is necessary yeah so uh thanks Kate uh the data that I already have is uh, or, uh correlational and it uh, it shows that um to the extent that uh, people believe that a range of ethnic groups uh, immigrated to Australia uh, earlier versus later. This uh, is associated with how Australian uh, they perceive these minority group members to be, such that uh, the earlier they perceive particular minority groups to have emigrated, um, the more Australian they perceive these uh, minorities to be. And so we have some correlational uh, evidence for it. And so, as you say, the next step would be uh, testing this sort of uh, experimentally. And I, I'm just thinking in terms of uh, rudimentary ideas at the moment for how we can test this experiment, uh, experimentally, but you will have seen on that slide, uh, on the where to next slide, there were some photos of uh, Asian Australians who were actually, despite being um, many of them born uh, and raised in Australia, they were excluded um, as a result of the white Australia policy. And uh, I thought as a very simple experiment to provide an initial test of this, we could just simply expose people almost like a sort of mediated contact, right? So we could expose people to stories, vignettes, uh, actual histories of um, Asian Australians and other ethnic minorities who have been part of Australian society. And hopefully this uh, this new information, which I imagine would be new for a lot of people, given you know how often people make the incorrect assumption that immigration is actually a really recent phenomenon. Um, I hope that exposing people to this in ex an experimental setting where one control group may not receive this information, uh, we may provide an initial test of... Um, of this idea that, uh, yeah, Asian Australians and other ethnic minorities have been part of uh, Australian history for a long time. And uh, just exposing people to information will allow them to recalibrate their sense of um, uh, who is Australian, who is not. And as a more sort of thinking more broadly, I've always had this uh, really, um, I don't know, far-fetched idea of recruiting a whole bunch of uh, older Asian Australians and older ethnic minorities who are uh, second, third, you know, and so forth generation Australian whose uh, families moved here decades or even centuries ago and um, getting them to sort of film a you know, web series or you know a, a series of videos where they just talk about growing up in Australia and uh, showing people these sort of videos over an extended period of time and uh, at the end of this, just uh, testing whether people who are exposed to the videos whereas people who are not differ in how Australian they perceive minorities to be. So that's just what I'm thinking right now uh, in that's terms interesting. of The steps. other way that um, I can't quite get my, I don't know how to get my camera work, but the other way <laughs> that this has been done is, and I'm not sure to what degree, when you, they're trying to be sort of uber Australians in your manipulations, <laughs> I mean, there'd be that work, there's work obviously done in Scotland where people show the values of being Scottish. That's it. So it's about instead of sort of an ethnic characterization of the national identity, More it's civic. a sort of citizen type. Yeah. And I know you went for, you know, the things they, they knew about Australia in a way. But yeah. what about the values? Was that in your manipulations as well, that they're upholding what it means to be Australian in terms of a fair go, um, you know, valuing the law, 
Mm. Um, treating people fairly. Those yeah. Kind of so um, I have started looking at that in my work on uh, political uh, perceptions of political candidates. So uh, I'll just, in my uh, political candidates manipulation, uh, in either condition, the Asian candidate or the white candidate had actually all of these um, civic values um, that they, yeah, as part of a vision statement, right? Uh, and even then, when all these, you know, values were uh, outlined, there was still um, a difference across these conditions, which was fascinating to me. Um, uh, but something that I'm actually wrangling with um, in the uh political uh in my test of you know perceptions of political candidates is although there is this negative evaluation of asian candidates in terms of national identity i don't know if you saw in my graph there was also what i wasn't expecting which was this increased perceptions of loyalty compared to the white candidate and also greater trust in the Asian candidate and greater um, support for the Asian candidate as direct effects. So although we got an indirect effect of uh, negative uh, perceptions through national identity perceptions, we actually got more direct effects, um, uh, positive direct effects. And so there is something going on there. And uh, yeah, so really interested in sort of... Um, uh, pursuing that and I think it might actually have something to do with those civic values yeah. right when they when they demonstrate those civic values maybe they are perceived they have this positive bias so if they didn't or if they criticized Australia in a certain way um, which a lot of politicians do right a lot of politicians um, sort of argue against the status quo um, as a way of uh, creating a better Australia and so uh, we're going to sort of test this idea in, in the future and um, determine whether if we manipulate that sort of sort of values um, uh, and have differing values, whether yeah, this affects perceptions of national identity, but also affects things like loyalty and trust. Mm -hmm. Great. I'll leave it there. I was just with one of the most diverse parliaments. That leadership kind of angle. Um, you know, and whether you say the same things, but you're a particular kind of parliamentarian. Uh, anyway, interesting. Lots to do. I'll let other, <laughs> yeah, other yeah. comment. Talk later, Michael. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. We have a question here from Ksenia. Hi, Ksenia. Hi, Michael. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is this is great, fascinating. Um, I work in accentedness and perce perception of uh, foreign accent. I'm a linguist, um, yes. and um, more recently, I I'm interested in employability and the effect of foreign accent on employability. And actually, in um, employability perceptions, um, uh, some recent review articles have also found support for both the um, processing efficiency and the uh, prejudice uh, explanation. Yeah. Uh, so th this is this is just a comment. My question is uh, in relation to uh, the other um, factors that you may have looked at. So you, you only talked about um, uh, perception of multiculturalism, but mm. I'm sure that you've looked at other things like uh, picture gender. So you you had both um, yes. uh, men and women. Uh, so did did that have an effect? Did you look at that? Did that have an effect? And what about other listener characteristics? Uh, did you look at age? Was there a correlation between age and uh, perception or um, uh, attitude towards multiculturalism and yeah, what, what about other characteristics of both the uh, picture and the listeners or the, the participants? Yeah, thanks, Ksenia. Um, so we uh, did in all of our studies where we show people a Facebook profile, for example, um, we had just to uh, ensure that the effects were generalizable and not just because we were using a particular stimulus. Uh, we had uh, two versions of uh, each of the categories. So two Asian men, two Asian women, um, two white men, two white women. Uh, yeah. And we didn't really get any gender effects. So this applied across gender and gender didn't moderate uh, any of these effects that we saw. Uh, we haven't done that with political candidates yet, but uh, we, yeah, we, we plan to do that. Uh, and in terms of other factors, um, haven't looked at demographics yet, such as uh, age, uh, but uh, have looked at uh, in in a 
big correlational study. Um, uh, some other uh, factors such as contact. So to what extent do you have positive contact with um, certain minority groups? Uh, to what extent do you have negative contact with certain minority groups? Um, like I was saying before, we've looked at sort of um, temporal distancing of immigration uh, of uh, different minority groups. And uh, just, uh, of course, you know, political um, conservatism and such. Uh, in, in so I guess, something that relates to political conservatism that um, applied to the uh, po perceptions of political candidates study was that um, we found that, you know, both progressives and conservatives demonstrated sort of this positive bias for the Asian candidate in terms of um, greater perceived loyalty, greater trust, and greater support for the candidate. Right, so we found that across the sample, but in terms of the negative perceptions that we found through national identity perceptions, such that you know um, Asian participants were perceived to be less Australian, and through that less loyal, and through that you know um, trusted less and supported less, that indirect effect it actually only emerged for um, conservative Australians. Uh, and it actually didn't emerge for um, more progressive Australians because more progressive Australians didn't actually see a difference in um, national identity across the Asian and the white political candidate. So uh, there is some evidence for political ideology moderating the effects as well. Um, and at the top of my mind, th those are the, the the key things that I can think of uh, now, and I haven't uh, tested uh, the rest yet. But that we we had a few other um, a few other measures as well, so just a, a general warmth measure as well. So your amount of uh, the amount of warmth you have towards different groups is associated with uh, how foreign you perceive those groups to be. And again, that can be a bi directional relationship, right? So the warmer you feel towards a group. Uh, the less foreign they ever seem to be, but also the less foreign they ever seem to be, the warmer you feel towards them, right? So, yeah, so those are the um, uh, uh, some of the other variables I've looked at. Michael, I might ask a follow-up question, if that's yeah. all right on that one. Of course. So I guess there are, there are two things in play here. One is sort of this conception of foreignness that people yes. might have. Where are people born? What do their yeah. accents say about them? That kind of thing. And yeah. the second is race. Yes, so I'm wondering if you have a hypothesis about if you had included in your conditions markers showing that white people had come from somebody somewhere else, say they were from England or even the United States or something like that. Yeah. How do you think that would figure in terms of those findings? It's really interesting, right? I, I haven't um, I haven't looked at that yet because um, I, I would hope that at least when you explicitly ask someone, you know, how Australian is this person, that people will just, you know, automatically uh, use nationality as a heuristic there. And they would, of course, rate an Asian Australian born in Australia as being more Australian than a white Australian, oh, sorry, a white person born in the UK. Um, you'd hope that would be the effect. And that's what I would hypothesize, given that it's such a strong, obvious cue. Um, but there has been other work looking at this, uh, not in terms of explicit uh, ratings, but implicit associations uh, that's been done over in the US. And uh, what they found is that on, a, uh, on an implicit level, Asian Americans who are known to be American are considered implicitly uh, or are less associated with uh, the US than white people who are known to be um, foreign. So uh, they did this using uh, celebrities. And so I think actually the title of the paper is, you know, is Lucy Liu uh, less American than Kate Winslet, All right? And they found in their work support for this um, on an implicit level, people are more likely to associate Kate Winslet with being American than they are Lucy Liu, despite... Um, being aware that Lucy Liu is actually an Asian American. I think it would be really interesting to find out more about that. Yeah. Uh, we have a question here from Kiyoshi. 
Hi, Jesse. Hi. Oh, hi, Michael. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. It was fantastic. Um, if you don't mind, I have two questions. Of course. Here. Yeah. Um, my first question is, um, you say for the, in terms of the, what can we do? You say you present the participant, the, the history, the long history of Asia, Australia mm. in, I mean, in Australia, I mean, instead of like immigration, just a recent thing, but have you ever think about maybe giving participants a history about the white Australian policy and see how like Asia community were marginalized and their voice were erased in the grand narrative of the Australian history? Would that be a, and um, would that be a thing that be, might be worth considering in your research? Yeah, of course. No, no, thank you for that. Um, no, it's a, it's a very interesting idea. So I have uh, sort of my current idea sort of uh, implicitly accounts for the white Australia policy, right? So um, possibly the discrepancy we see nowadays is just uh, a residual artifact of this uh, white Australia policy that was instated for so long. Uh, and uh, so one of the motivations for you know presenting people with histories of ethnic minority immigration to Australia was to sort of counteract that. But of course, you know, as you suggest, we could probably counteract that more directly, right? By just um, showing people how actually on a structural level, uh, we saw this exclusion of uh, ethnic minorities in the Australian context uh, for so long and something that was actually written into uh, legislation. And uh, potentially through that, we might see um, uh, increases in national identity, but also probably politicized increases in national identity if you catch my drift right so we may we may see emotions aroused such as anger um and compassion uh which uh, in particular with anger has been shown to increase collective action uh, in majority groups for um, minority group causes and so if to the extent that, you know, exposing people to the white Australia policy arouses a sense of anger, we might see that that anger uh, can be turned into this sort of, um, you know, th the opposite sort of motivated reasoning um, when rating the uh, Australianness of uh, minority versus majority targets, right? So we might actually see a motivation to bolster national identity of minority targets as a, as you know, a, um, uh, sort of a resistance type of behavior. Yeah, no, it's a really great idea. Thank you. Yeah, um, just to come to my second question. Um, I personally, I just also feel like the the concept of Asia is also like pretty much like constructed concept, and also it kind of incorporates many diverse social and cultural group that there are just you know so many different type of asia from different countries from different community like would that be sometimes i don't know like be problematic to to have a such like um like concept in the in the first hand like say that there's uh, like a white group there's an asia group like you just pigeonhole so many different group of people into yes. the way yeah into a grand group and then and, and the, do, do you think do you see this might be um bit um problematic to some extent of course no of course i do and uh, it's it's an issue that i've been grappling with in my own research and also an issue that's being grappled with in social psychology um the collapsing over such a uh, broad and uh heterogeneous uh, groups into just simple racial categories that we look at in our studies. And uh, of course, I could imagine that um, if we did break it down further and we did look at rather than, you know, looking at Asian targets that we just looked um, uh, more fine grained, such as, you know, examining how Chinese targets are perceived, how Vietnamese targets are perceived, um, we could probably take that approach as well. And uh, I think we might, we, we would still find the same effects. And 
I guess one of the motivations for using sort of collapsed um, racial groups in this way is that it presents a, a simpler way of testing things in an experimental context, right? Um, that uh, allows us to test these sort of broader questions um, uh, and make sort of more generalized conclusions about uh, a particular phenomenon that future research might go on to look at at a more deeper level with more specific ethnic groups. But I, I do agree with you that um, it, it is a problem. And uh, yeah, there are all sorts of considerations that come into play when uh, we decide to look at things from a more broader racial lens or a more specific ethnic lens. And one of those, if you're looking to recruit participants from that group themselves, is it's uh, substantially more difficult um, to recruit participants if you pose those additional constraints, right? So if you just wanted um, uh, Chinese Australians, for example, um, you'd have a much harder time finding uh, that sample than if you were to broaden the scope, uh, broaden the scope and um, uh, recruit uh, Asian Australian participants, right? So, yeah, no, I completely agree with you that it is um, an issue uh, and it, it represents a huge challenge for us in social psychology. Thank you very much. No worries. Thank you. We have to wrap things up there. I'd like to thank everyone who logged in for the webinar this afternoon. I'd especially like to thank Dr. Michael Tai. Um, thanks so much for your generosity in sharing your research. I really look forward to seeing where you go with it next. Thanks, Melissa. And thank you everyone again.